Hello, I'm Chris Jenks, and I'm sorry not to be at the conference, and as many of you very much. Today I will be re reviewing the how ibogaine is isolated from iboga or synthesized from Volcanca africana bark. I will also go over the analysis of iboga alkaloids and touch on cultivation and other promising alkaloids of iboga and their potential sources. There's a lot of material in this presentation, but it's available online and you can contact me about it after the conference. Um, all the procedures I'll be going over are public domain and available online. Here is the iboga plant. Only the root bark contains any useful amount of ibogaine, about 3% by weight. It contains smaller amount of a few other alkaloids too, ibogamine, tabernanthine, and ibogaline, which may contribute to the effects of iboga. Iboga bark can be eaten directly to obtain the effects of the iboga alkaloids, as it is by the buidi. This is very efficient and makes the chemistry I'm about to present unnecessary. However, the size of a bark pile needed to obtain a high dose may seem intimidating, especially during a nauseous state. Also, some people have found high doses of bark to produce more physical discomfort than equivalently psychoactive doses of purified alkaloids. I'm not the first chemist to publish an extraction of iboga, but my extraction method specifically uses low technology equipment and can easily be learned by someone without a background in chemistry. When I started this work in the 90s, my goal was to increase the availability of ibogaine by reducing the cost and increasing the possible places to manufacture it. Stirring the powdered bark with dilute vinegar or very dilute hydrochloric acid resembles the process of alkaloid removal from the chewed bark by stomach acid. Very little alkaloid remains in the bark after several extractions. Extract is separated from the root powder by filtering it through paper or squeezing it through cloth, like this pillowcase. This is somewhat like passage of the ibogaine alkaloids through the stomach lining. A bit of antacid neutralizes the acid that was keeping the alkaloids dissolved, causing this fluffy brown solid to precipitate. I've always thought it was a miracle for this alkaloid mixture to be solid and not oil, but then it seems strange that peanuts are solid when grinding them makes a fluid paste. Thanks to this total alkaloid, or TA, being a solid, it can be efficiently filtered out. This can take a long time, days, getting slower and slower until you give up and pour the original filter into a second fresh filter. A warm breeze really helps the TA to dry out. When it does, it makes hard, curled chunks like clay on a dry riverbed. After grinding to a powder, TA seems to last for years without losing potency. At 3% ibogaine, a gram dose of ibogaine would require 33 grams of bark to be eaten to get an equivalent dose. At about 50% ibogaine, the same dose would only take 2 grams of TA, which could fit inside gel caps. The only problem is that TA seems to cause the same discomfort at high dose that the original root does because it contains all the original alkaloids. TA can be further refined to make purified total alkaloid hydrochloride, PTAHCl, using acetone and hydrochloric acid. The portion of the TA left over after extraction with acetone, spent TA, seems completely inert. When I ingested a gram, it had no effect at all. Advantages of PTA are that the inert half of the material in TA gets removed, along with trace alkaloids that may contribute to physical discomfort, leaving ibogaine and other similar alkaloids. PTA has about the same potency as ibogaine itself and dissolves in water making rectal administration possible. The big disadvantage of making PTA is that about one-third of the active alkaloid ends up as waste recovered alkaloid, or RA. RA is isolated by distilling away the acetone and precipitating the residue from a water solution with base. When I tried ingesting 970 milligrams of RA to see if it would be safe, I experienced severe nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, extreme diuresis, and migraine lasting 30 hours which took attention away from any psychoactivity. For a few days after, I noticed the soles of my feet itching. I didn't know if this toxicity was from concentrating the trace alkaloids in the TA or from their degradation during processing. 
To try to find out, I ingested 300 mg of RA. This had all the negative effects that 970 mg had had, but lasted about 20 hours. It goes beyond the negative effects that I would expect from ingesting the 2 grams of TA it could have been made from. However, it is extremely important for anyone manufacturing PTA to store the RA and not discard it because of the large amount of ibogaine and other promising active alkaloids it contains. These alkaloids can be separated using column chromatography with basic alumina and toluene. The more RA that accumulates, the bigger the incentive grows for someone to set up a purification process. I sure hope all of the manufacturers have been taking this advice. Many people have asked if PTA can be purified to get pure ibogaine HCl. Yes, this can be done by recrystallizing it from alcohol, but I don't recommend it because each time it is recrystallized, about one third of it remains in the alcohol, which has, then has to be dealt with to keep from wasting scarce iboga. Besides, other than being able to call the product purer, there doesn't seem to be any benefit to ibogaine over good PTA and there is an unlimited supply of pure ibogaine from Volkanga. Ibogaine only grows naturally in a few African countries as shown here because of consistent warm temperature it demands. It can be cultivated outside Africa under tropical conditions but is slow growing. So Iboga has always been scarce and given how important it is to the Buidi and the rest of the world, it should not be wild harvested. Cultivated ibogaine may cost more, but the right thing to do is not always the easiest. I was able to grow ibogaine in Durban, South Africa, thanks to the mild coastal weather. Three years later, there is still a plant that has grown to about 70 centimeters. That is small for three years' growth, but it was placed by a house and neglected. But it is surviving the winters. As I mentioned, ibogaine is being produced from the Voacongine in Voaconga bark. This process is more complicated than making PTA from Iboga bark, but is not constrained by the supply of bark. The range of Voaconga africana tree is much greater than that of Iboga and is not endangered. It can be cultivated in more countries beyond Africa because it is more tolerant of cold. Voaconga is a particularly abundant source because the tree is cultivated on a wide scale to obtain the seed. Voaconga seed contains tabersinine, which is used to manufacture the circulatory enhancer vimpocetine and the extremely expensive chemotherapy agent vinblastine. My friend Mr. Ghani and I went to Cameroon to visit a botanical supplier, Christopher Awa, and see his Iboga farm. I captured this picture showing an Iboga shrub on the left and a Volaconga africana tree on the right that had both been planted three years before, in 2011. The Iboga is too small to cultivate yet, but here is a video that Christopher sent me of how these plants look now. Notice how much the Iboga grew in the second three years. This is our Christopher here. And you can only see that this, uh, this is the plant I visited five years ago in Mr. Ghani. It has developed somewhere. Corrichia can no fire. It is ready now for use, even, even for the Boga Rupa. So this is the shaman here I want to give you. The plants are ready, and it is five years since we visited Cameroon. But all in all, the plant is seven years today. And uh, on the other hand, you can see this is the Vokanga plant tree that you saw that started bearing fruit. You can see fruit very soon they will be ready now for consumption or for use or extraction as well. So this is the plant. You can go deeply. You will see the main, the main thing which is hidden behind there. Let's go down there. As you can also see here, this is the mother tree. Even this root now is used for extraction. So this is the main plant that you saw five years ago it has developed so well. On this side, you can see the fruit. It has been, it has been given so many fruits which will be ready for consumption anytime from now. So the plants have done so well. This is greeting to all of you.
I don't have much to say, but in the next, uh, I hope maybe in the near future you'll come to see these plants again. Thank you very much. Bye. Getting from Volkanga bark to Ibogaine is much more complicated than getting from Iboga to PTA. But that doesn't mean it can't be done using low technology equipment and simple procedures. It just takes a lot more of them. The main challenge faced with sourcing from Volkanga is that there is less Volkangine in Volkanga trunk bark than there is in Ibogaine in Iboga root bark about 1% compared to 3%. For this reason alone, it may be more economical to perform the initial extraction at the tree farm than to ship tons of bark to another country for extraction. But after the alkaloids are extracted out, there is the further problem that Volcangine is only about 7% of the total alkaloid mixture, while Ibogaine is about 50% of Iboga TA. So there's a lot more to separate. Fortunately, a special feature of the volcangine molecule, the carbomethoxy group that must be removed to make it into ibogaine, makes volcangine less basic than most other alkaloids. That means that a weak acid can be used to extract other alkaloids away from volcangine, and most of the volcangine refinement depends on this feature. Once pure, volcangine is easily converted into ibogaine using potassium hydroxide in boiling alcohol. The ibogaine is then purified and converted into the finished hydrochloride salt. This factory procedure can be broken down into four phases. Isolation of the Volkanga total alkaloid, semi-purification of the Volkangene, finished purification of the Volkangene, and conversion of the Volkangene into ibogaine with subsequent purification. The first phase is recommended at the Volkanga farm, and the last phase could be carried out close to the place of use if, for example, there were some legal problem with shipping the final ibogaine but not having it. It should be easy to obtain volcangine from one of the three ibogaine factories for this purpose. Too bad volcangine doesn't seem to be useful in itself. When I took 200 milligrams of it, it just made me physically sick without any noticeable psychoactivity. The three factories that use volcanga bark to produce ibogaine are the one belonging to Phytostan in Chennai, India, Acid Gain in Durban, South Africa, and Mubello Manelli in South Africa. Several years ago, I went to Durban to try to figure out why PTA wasn't forming a solid like it had in the past. At first, I assumed there must be too much water in the acetone or in the hydrochloric acid. These things turned out to be fine. What I found instead was that the root bark being sent by the longtime Iboga supplier had much lower alkaloid content than usual, and it seemed to have alkaloids in it that were not from iboga. We suspected that the bark was either from immature iboga plants, non-iboga plants that had looked similar to iboga, or just random plants. Maybe the high price that iboga bark had risen to had attracted scammers, or maybe iboga is so scarce that it is getting hard to recognize. Either way, there has been a need to test Iboga products to verify their composition. Other groups, along with myself, have developed analytical procedures to make quality control of Iboga products possible. The company I prepared my procedures at and used to recommend for the service, Biochemical and Scientific Consultants in Hilton, South Africa, has stopped offering it. So if anyone has one I can recommend, please let me know. Analysis of iboga alkaloids depends on a method known as chromatography. What chromatography amounts to is using a solvent to flush a sample through an absorbent solid. The solid sticks to some components more than others, causing them to flush through at different speeds and become separated. Here is an example of thin layer of chromatography, which you can do yourself to see if iboga alkaloids are present in a sample. What makes chromatography work is the high surface area of, of the adsorbent solid. The higher the surface area, the better the separation. Surface area can be increased by making the solid particles smaller, but that slows the flow of solvent. To bring the flow back up, high pressure is applied, and that is the concept behind high pressure liquid chromatography, or HPLC. HPLC is used to identify and quantify components in a complex mixture such as iboga. This is what the raw data from an HPLC looks like after an analysis of TA. It shows peaks which can be identified as ibogaine, ibogamine, ibogaline, and volcangine. I have not been able to identify tabernanthine. The areas under these peaks is proportional to the concentration of the alkaloids. 
This HPLC of PTA is much cleaner than TA as expected. If you look closely, you will notice that the Volcan gene is missing and that the ratio of ibogaline to ibogamine is a bit higher than it was for TA. Finally, this HPLC shows the abundant ibogaine, ibogaline, and ibogamine present in a sample of RA. This is also where the Volcan gene ended up. A less expensive instrument is the gas chromatograph, or GC, which is also useful to quantify the iboga alkaloids. This is a GC analysis of PTA. Notice how it compares to the HPLC analysis of PTA. Much remains to be learned about the pharmacology of alkaloids similar to ibogaine, an area offering tremendous potential opportunity for treatment professionals. A great place to start is the minor iboga alkaloids, ibogamine, tabernaphine, and ibogaline. Not only are their structures very similar to ibogaine, and thus they are likely to retain its useful properties, but they also have a long history of human use. This history puts a limit on the risk of their consumption, which is much greater for a new compound. What is not known very well is the effects of each of these alkaloids when taken in pure form. When I once ingested 125 milligrams of ibogaline, I found it similar to ibogaine, but two to three times more potent and a bit longer lasting. A sample of TA analyzed because of its unusually high potency was found to be unusually rich in ibogamine, but there is so much more to know. These iboga alkaloids don't have to come from iboga. Just as volcangine is more abundant in nature than ibogaine, so are the esters of the other iboga alkaloids, and they can be deesterified the same way as a volcangine Coronaridine is especially prevalent in Tabernay Montana species, or the widely cultivated Madagascar periwinkle, and can be easily converted into ibogamine. Likewise, isovolcangine can make tabernamphine and conopharyngine, such as from Tabernay Montana ventricosa, can make ibogaline. The only thing missing is the demand, and the only reason there is no demand is that favorable properties likely to be found in these alkaloids have not yet been reported. You can obtain the material in this presentation and my past presentations, along with, with manuals for the production of ibogaine from iboga or volcanga bark, and for the HPLC analysis of iboga products, and much more, at my website, puzzlepiece.org. I feel that my work as a chemist developing ibogaine production methods is complete. The loose ends I still hope to work on are the isolation of minor iboga alkaloids finding the best sources for them from plants or industrial tailings, and to find out what it is in iboga products that can cause terrible nausea so it can be screened for. I would like to thank Anwar Jiwa of Minds Alive in Durban, South Africa, Abdul Ghani of Acid Gain in Durban, Sandra Baya of Biochemical and Scientific Consultants in Hilton, South Africa, Dana Beal, the Christian community, and many others in this room and beyond for making all this work possible. I would also like to thank my wife, Dana, for creating this video from my mess of notes and pictures. Thank you.